Well, gang, it's been another crazy couple weeks on the internet in the weather department. Last Tuesday, Hurricane Melissa made a devastating Category 5 landfall near Black River, Jamaica. It was the strongest Atlantic hurricane on record to make landfall, both from a wind standpoint and an air pressure standpoint. For days, the U.S. National Hurricane Center delivered life-saving advance notice on the impending hazards. Scores of U.S.-based digital meteorologists did the same, including on social media. Yet last Thursday morning, the Jamaica Observer, Jamaica's biggest newspaper, published this editorial. Did the international media cry wolf on Hurricane Melissa? Now, initially, I thought this had to be satire. Alex Jones himself couldn't think of something more tone-deaf than publishing an article like this two days after a devastating landfall. My first question, do they know the hurricane hit? It's crying wolf if something doesn't happen. Not if it does. And, oh wait, it did. Scenes of catastrophic damage like this go on for dozens of miles. At the time we filmed this on Monday, 28 fatalities had been confirmed in Jamaica. Now, the Jamaica Observer is based in downtown Kingston. Kingston got winds gusting up to 59 miles per hour. That is tropical storm force. In Kingston, folks hardly lost their palm fronds. And sure, heavy rain and flooding were an issue in a couple areas. But realistically, most of Kingston had power back within 48 hours. You know who didn't get power back that quickly? The thousands of people off to the West who lost their homes, their businesses, their livelihoods, and everything they ever worked for. Alleging the media cried wolf suggests an event didn't happen. And that is an unconscionable insult to those who lost everything. At the time the Jamaica Observer published that article, nine bodies had yet to be recovered. And I'm sure if you ask the families of the victims, they probably wouldn't say the international media cried wolf. Now, I'd like to unpack the article, but also discuss some of the broader undercurrents as a whole. From a journalistic standpoint, it seems like all journalistic ethics were thrown out the window in this article. For starters, you don't publish an article like this until the scope of the damage and devastation becomes clear, which is not 34 hours after the hurricane pulls away. If you're going to include quotes, tell us who you're quoting, cite your sources, do not make up quotes. And moreover, Jamaica is more than just the capital city of Kingston. Only a quarter of Jamaica's population lives in the Kingston metro. The rest is scattered about the country. Now, y'all remember the tornado outbreak of April 27th, 2011? Can you imagine if James Spann went on the air and said, well, I guess this event really wasn't that bad just because downtown Birmingham wasn't hit? Forget the other 62 tornadoes that carved through the state of Alabama, killing at least 247 people. Forget Hackleburg, forget Common, forget Pratt City. That would be crazy and incredibly insensitive and appalling. We'd never say that. So let's not rewrite history as if utter calamity didn't just strike thousands of families in Westmoreland and St. Elizabeth parishes off to the west. The Jamaica Observer fell into a typical human fallacy. We as humans tend to think that if something didn't happen to us, it just didn't happen, period. Yet virtually everything we called for to happen did indeed happen. A deforested, shredded landscape. SUVs thrown, tossed, flipped upside down. Severe damage to even steel reinforced or concrete buildings, reminiscent of what we'd see in an EF4 tornado. And some of the trees were even debarked, something again we usually only see with high end tornado damage. All told, the forecast was spot on but people are rejecting the idea that the dire forecasts came to fruition. It's a human reaction called survivor's bias. We're told something could be deadly, and then we survive. So it mustn't have been deadly. Everybody we talked to also survived, so it wasn't deadly for them either. Newspapers, TV, they only interview the survivors. Because we can't interview the 28 people who died in the storm, who either drown in the surge or succumb to blunt force trauma from debris being thrown. Their stories died with them. That's a tragic thing to say, but it's true. So the news stories become skewed towards a survival bias, and suddenly it becomes easy to say, this wasn't that bad, because I was fine. For the older generations, some of this survivor's bias has lingered all the way since Hurricane Gilbert, which struck back in September 12, 1988, as a high-end Category 3, borderline Category 4. 49 Jamaicans died. 
You see, human nature is to contextualize information and forecasts in the realm of whatever we've experienced. So if we're told a really bad storm is coming, we'll think back to the worst storm we've experienced firsthand and then assume this next one might be a little bit worse. And that will inform the actions we take and the preparations we make. The issue comes when humans are told about an event for which they have no basis of comparison. In this case, nobody alive on the island of Jamaica had ever experienced Category 4 or Category 5 impacts on the island until late October. They never had, despite being a hurricane-prone nation. And that puts us as scientists in a conundrum. We have to acknowledge and respect that our audience has some understanding of and experience with hurricanes, while simultaneously conveying that nobody in our audience has experience with the magnitude of the anticipated impacts. And for whatever reason, that idea proved upsetting, sort of struck a nerve with a large percentage of the population. Many US-based meteorologists were met with unfortunate commentary long before the storm even began. To that end, you can't grade a forecast before the storm actually happens. But more importantly, I'll simply say this. Most, if not all, meteorologists in the business are in the business because they want to be helpers, not to get rich. The United States sees more extreme weather than any other developed nation on the planet. As such, we've built up an arsenal of weather satellites to allow us to see what's going on. Large-scale weather models, Hurricane-specific models like the Hafs A and Hafs B models, the NOAA Hurricane Hunter planes, the Air Force Hurricane Hunter planes, we spend millions and millions, tens of millions, on flying into the storms every six hours, regardless of whether or not they'll impact the United States. The U.S. National Hurricane Center produces the forecasts that appear almost verbatim on official Jamaican government letterhead. So regardless of how we want to discuss it, that's the reason that most of Jamaica had four days advance notice ahead of an impending hurricane. Staff, resources, research, not necessarily prayers or luck. Much of the high-end verbiage seen on social media originated with National Hurricane Center forecasts. And so to the Jamaica observer, I don't think really anyone in the meteorological or journalistic enterprises here is trying to get rich quick through a hurricane. Nobody is doing this for the money. And lastly, like it or not, News coverage equals awareness, and awareness ultimately reflects in aid. So to the Jamaica observer, it's not controversial to say that Jamaica will likely need international aid after this tragedy. Support for that comes from people knowing what happened and the messaging that garnered awareness of what was going on to begin with. The Jamaica observer itself writes that coming to Jamaica's aid is critical. I agree. But that aid is predicated on attention, and the groundwork for that is forecasts. Now, I'll be the first to admit that not all weather coverage is good. Like this, about two weeks ago, we told you about a popular weather vendor that fought against the National Hurricane Center to basically claim that a nor'easter was really a tropical storm in disguise. Now, the science said otherwise, but that didn't stop the company from willfully and intentionally misleading the public. And now, Three weeks later, the company is once again doubling down. You notice anything here in this article they just posted? If you look closely, the company added their imaginary tropical storm to a list of official tropical storms to impact the Atlantic this year. Some might consider this a case of juvenile petulance, but truth be told, I think it's something deeper. Now, let me be clear. Science is a discussion, and no forecaster is infallible. Back in January 2023, I, for example, saw something similar. I saw a storm that I thought was subtropical and should have been named. I thought the National Hurricane Center was missing something, and so too did a bunch of other folks. The science seemed to support that this swirl off the East Coast could be considered a subtropical storm. So I presented my case at the time on television using facts, evidence, and technical definitions to make the case as to why, scientifically, I thought it should be classified. The following year, the National Hurricane Center released findings saying that, yeah, it should have been named and it was a subtropical storm. Science is a discussion. They looked at and used data to make their call. That's how science is supposed to work. The scientific method does not mean shirking science and facts and just going off vibes for the sake of clicks, engagement, or ego. Record keeping matters. And as a field, we strive to be scientific, deliberate, fact-driven and measured. 
At least, most of us anyway. If you want to play science, be scientific. But this is rather egregious, trying to rewrite meteorological history for the sake of ego. Where have we seen that before? Oh yeah. But calling a system something that it's not, and then bashing the rest of the weather enterprise for not doing so, is scientifically wrong, morally problematic, and downright unprofessional. This is my favorite part, though. It was the only known source to describe the storm as a tropical wind and rainstorm. Yeah, because it wasn't tropical. Meteorologist Matthew Capucci was the first to describe this quacking animal <laughs> as a walrus. See how asinine that sounds? Now, of course, it's an issue when private companies do it, but what happens when the National Weather Service does it? Well, let's talk about it. On the night of October 24th, severe storms were moving through the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, and my friend and colleague Riley Dibble adroitly tweeted that an unworn tornado was on the ground in Fort Worth. That takes hailstones to tweet, especially because doing so contradicts the National Weather Service. It takes even greater confidence to be live streaming that in front of tens of thousands of people and says this is a tornado on the ground south of Benbrook heading off to the east. All right, thank you, Riley, for the update. So there may be a tornado right now in progress. Again, it is not likely... But Max and Riley were right, unequivocally. Here's reflectivity showing a so-called kink in the line as warm, moist air curls back into a circulation. Here's red against green on velocity, touching winds in opposite directions right next to each other. This is a very common region for storms to form in a squall line. We call it the northern bookend vortex. The northern part of a squall curls back on itself, and you get counterclockwise spin and a few brief touchdowns. Now, the couplet, the velocity couplet showing the rotation, moves over time, so there's continuity. But here's the damning part. Radar shows debris moving with the rotation. This yellow, bluish blob, that's correlation coefficient showing spiky stuff being lofted into the atmosphere, i.e. debris. And notice, right along the path that debris ball takes is where we see three, four, five damage reports. And indeed, there was some minor tornado damage observed. And yet, the National Weather Service in Dallas-Fort Worth released their findings saying the damage was associated with straight line winds. Apparently, they're going the route of, if it looks like a duck, and quacks, like a duck, it must be a walrus. Now sure, it would look bad if they didn't issue a tornado warning and a tornado formed, but how about we just say it wasn't a tornado? Once again, shirking science for the benefit of ego is a dangerous precedent to set. That is somewhat of a rarity though. In fact, most National Weather Service offices are pretty sedulous with the way they keep data. You remember Mindy Behrens, we talked about her back during the Enderlin EF5 tornado in North Dakota. She literally convened an entire survey team and a forensics team to analyze a single piece of data. That's dedication. But not all offices are created equal. It took me four emails, multiple phone calls, and nearly a full year to get this obvious tornado confirmed and in the official database. It should not have taken that long. Some offices just don't care about official record keeping quite as much. And some are, unfortunately, for lack of a better term, a little bit stubborn. This swirling cloud you see right here sucking stuff up into the sky in Maryland is apparently straight line winds. The National Weather Service office in Sterling never wanted to investigate. Now the office and I have spoken multiple times. We've called, we've emailed, and despite repeated attempts, it just seems that the office is declining to confirm this as a tornado. And the funniest part, they did have a tornado warning in effect. Like, they nailed this forecast. Take the win. Confirm that you were right. But in the end, science is objective, both in the public and the private sectors. Those of us who work in the media do our best to dissect and break down the science in a way that the public can understand. We don't always get it right. The public is inherently distrusting of the media and of science. So being a scientist in the media is no easy task these days, and we have to work extra hard to earn, not get, to earn that trust. And lastly, one more thing in the past couple weeks has been irritating me. Rainbows. Social media is chock full of pictures of rainbow icebergs and rainbow clouds and these rainbow storms, and my personal favorite, octuple rainbows. All obviously AI generated, or apparently not that obvious. Now you can get up to two extra rainbows, 
when you get something called a reflected light bow. The water has to be still, there has to be sort of a body of water. The sun shines down, bounces off that water like a mirror, and back into the sky, causing two more rainbows. And sometimes you can get extra colors on the inside of a primary bow. We call that a supernumerary bow. But no, there are no octuple rainbows. I'm sorry to disappoint. In the meantime, it has been a crazy few weeks on social media. I feel like every week, the internet gets to be a weirder and weirder place. We're doing our best. We always will. I'll do my best, and, and I don't always get it right. And if I don't, let me know. As always, thank you for trusting my radar. I'm senior meteorologist Matthew Capucci.